<laughs> oh, great. Fantastic. Thank you. W is, is, and, and is one of them the thermal electric? Um, Thanks a lot. Good, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's, come on, with the stimulating meeting. Yeah. Look, I, I told Chris, I said, some places I'd be tired by now, but it's been a great day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm leaving tonight, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks very much, and uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Van Der for the invitation. I've had an, an absolutely fantastic day. Um, it's been really stimulating. And, and I'm happy to be able to share some of the work we're doing in my group at MIT, in particular on, on trying to develop new materials for energy, uh, solar energy capture and storage. Um, now, I, I think with, with energy, with talks about energy, I think Many of us are, are, are maybe a little tired of these sort of long introductions about how much energy we use. And so I've sort of simplified it. This is my introduction. Um, we use a lot, and, and this is for, this, for solar applications, um, and the sun makes a lot more. Um, and there are sort of four uh, ways, if you want to break it down, in which we use the sun's energy. Um, uh, in one way of PV, we make electricity out of it. In another, we try to make fuels like photosynthesis, uh, mimicking photosynthesis. Um, and uh, we can use the sun's energy to generate heat. Um, and we can also uh, make these fuels, which I call solar thermal fuels. And what I'm going to tell you about today is some of the work that we've been doing in these two areas, in solar photovoltaics and, um, and in solar thermal fuels. Um, so I'll start with uh, some work we're doing in thermal solar thermal fuels, and then about halfway through, I'll switch to, to talking about our, our work on PV. And I, I'm not going to tell you about the methods we use today. This isn't really going to be a methods talk. This is going to be a talk about the materials and the applications um, for those materials. Um, but, uh, but we use sort of a variety of atomic scale, mostly atomic scale uh, modeling techniques that I'd be happy to, um, uh, to talk to you about, anybody about afterwards if they're interested. Um, and, and so let me just sort of start with this first topic, which is solar thermal fuels. And some of you may not uh, uh, have heard of these before. Um, and, so, and so let me kind of take a step back and just tell you, um, you know, about the sort of this, this use of the sun as heat. So that was that upper right quadrant. It's actually one of the oldest ways to use the sun's energy, right? You, you take a barrel, you paint it black, you fill it with water, and you put it on your rooftop. It's a very efficient way to use the sun. Um, um, and so you can make hot water, and if you concentrate light with mirrors and tracking systems, 
you can actually uh, make very hot uh, materials, water or, or other materials. Um, and, and if you get temperatures high enough, you can generate electricity not too inefficiently. Um, now, actually, this, this way of using the sun to make heat um, is, if you look at this, sorry, this is a little hard to read, but uh, this is the uh, produced energy. And you can see this way of making heat from the sun is actually the second most utilized renewable resource in the world, second only to wind. Um, making electricity in, the, in this way is, is, is quite a bit less utilized. But it's a very uh, prominent technology because it's so simple and easy. Now, whether you use the sun's energy to make uh, small scale heat, like warm water, or you, you use it to make very high temperature heat to make electricity, you, you will run into a common set of problems. Um, and, and these are sort of some of the main challenges with solar thermal power in general, okay? whether that's, uh, again, hot water or, or higher temperatures. Um, first and foremost, you, you lose the energy, right? You re-radiate um, the heat back out. Um, um, secondly, for depending on the application, you actually need to use fossil fuel-based energy um, to, um, to keep the material hot, to keep the working fluid hot. So in these kinds of, 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 um, of applications, you actually want to keep the molten salts used um, hot for an extended period of time, so you use fossil fuel energy to do that. Um, in, in depending on the application, you need highly reflective coatings and tracking. Um, they, they can take up a very large footprint. And this is one of the most important ones. It's not transportable, right? So using the sun's energy as heat means you have to use it uh, where you make it. It's, on demand, it's not on demand and it's not portable. Now, that's where solar thermal, the idea of solar thermal fuels comes in because it can overcome a lot of these challenges. So let me just tell you very simply what they are by using a photo switch as an example. Um, this is azobenzene. Okay, so this is a, a molecule that in its ground state looks like this. When, you, when it absorbs light, it can go through a structural change. In this case, it's a very simple um, trans to cis, a conformational change, so it's basically bending the angle. That structural change stores energy because it's higher in energy than this ground state. Okay, so there's a delta H of energy that's stored in that. And by applying the appropriate trigger, which can be a catalyst or, or uh, other means, um, you can get that molecule, you can actually make that molecule go back to the ground state, and when it goes back, it releases that stored energy in the form of heat. Okay, that's basically, that is a solar thermal fuel. Okay, and the idea is that this could be a cycle that you could do repeatedly. Right? So um, you're capturing the sun's energy and you're storing it in the form of releasable heat. Now this looks very appealing, and it is, because um, there would be no emissions, it's 100% renewable, um, it's rechargeable without access to the power grid, so you can charge it by the sun. Um, you can think of it like a rechargeable heat battery if you want. Um, and it has the, the opportunity for long-term energy storage, uh, on-demand use, and it's portable. And because of all these really appealing characteristics, it's also not surprising that this isn't a new concept. Right? In fact, this is really a blast from the past. Um, there was a lot of work done in the 1970s and, um, and early 80s on solar thermal fuels. And it was a, a number of different uh, molecules were identified that can go through this cycle. Okay, so one of the champion systems was norbornadiene quadracycline, where norbornadiene uh, absorbs light, converts into quadracycline, which can store more than an EV per molecule, and then be triggered to release uh, that as heat. The problem with this, and essentially all of the systems that were studied at, at the time, is that they did not have good enough cyclability. See, there's, a, there's going to be, for this kind of, of material to be useful, you need to be able to cycle it many times, because there's going to be an upfront cost for the fuel. So if you don't have a long lifetime, it's not going to be very useful. Um, and in fact, you would see in scientific papers, you would see um, 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 quotes like this towards the end, a photochemical solar energy storage plant, although technically feasible, is not economically justified, right? basically because of this problem. So there's a lot of work on these materials to try to increase their cyclability. And, um, and the problem, the reason why they weren't cyclable is because they degraded. And you can see just for this case, um, you know, there, there are degradation pathways. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you know, just looking at norbornadiene, it has stability. Um, it starts to decompose at around 600 Kelvin, and it, it, it decomposes into things like toluene, which are stable to much higher temperatures. Right? Um, so, so these are the pathways that, that, that make these systems not cyclable, and so a lot of work was done to try to prevent them. And many substitutions were made. Uh, metal atoms were, were substituted in the system. Uh, different ligand chemistries were tried, push-pull. Uh, chemistries were, were attempted. And, and actually, you know, at the time, the, the cyclability was increased substantially. 
from, say, 50 cycles to 1,000. The, the problem is that no matter what people tried, when you increase one really important attribute, uh, you wound up making something else that was really important, like the quantum yield or, or the density, uh, much worse. So there's no magic bullet was found. There's always a trade-off between right, quantum yield is basically how much you can charge up right, at a time, um, uh, uh, how efficiently they absorb the light, how much energy you store, um, the thermal stability, how long you can keep it in that charge state, and, and of course the cyclability. So, so there's no system that was found that could tick all these boxes. And, and basically the idea was for the most part abandoned. Um, now there was a case in 1996 that was a, a molecule that was discovered that could store a decent amount of energy, almost an EV per molecule. Um, this was made in the Volpart lab at, um, at, at UC Berkeley. And, and it's interesting because this actually can cycle uh, thousands and thousands of times with no degradation. So this was actually what got me first interested in this, in this whole uh, uh, topic of solar thermal fuels because this one case cycles, has, has high cycleability, but it wasn't understood why. And so that, that's something that a computational person gets really excited about. Um, and so we can model um, the behavior of this, and we did. Um, and what we found, um, again, I, I want to get to sort of our new material, so I'm, I'm going through this part a little quickly. But basically what we did is we, we, we examined um, how this molecule releases its heat, okay? And so we were able to model that, and this is the reaction uh, uh, profile. This is the energy of that molecule as it's releasing heat. And you see, these are these barriers that are critical to the stability of that charged state. So this is the charged state, and that's the uncharged state. And we can model this. Uh, very accurately using uh, density functional theory. Um, and I won't go through the details. You can't see it really in the movie. The movie is just because it's a movie, which movies are cool. Um, but basically, there are sort of two things that happen when it releases the heat. First, it forms a carbon-carbon bond that goes like this. Okay? First, it forms a carbon-carbon bond, and then it rotates around it. And the fact that it does those two things means you have an intermediate state. And what we were able to find is that that intermediate state was really identifying that was important because it's the taller barrier that dictates the stability. Right? And we needed to know uh, information about that rotation. And, and what we tried was, at, at the time, was, was we, we tried to substitute anything for ruthenium. Right? Um, and nothing worked. Um, and the reason is that uh, this, this is a very interesting molecule, but uh, you're not going to spend $75,000 a kilogram on your solar thermal fuel. Right? So we really needed to get ruthenium out. And what I wanted to do was to, to really find a broader framework. So we tried lots of substitutions on this one molecule, um, but again, not, none of the other uh, materials that we tried were stable, and it has to do with this, uh, this reaction path. So that gets me to sort of um, my, my motivation for why this is a really interesting problem to revisit. Okay? The computational power uh, for designing materials uh, it has increased tremendously. Uh, we can screen thousands of materials now. Uh, just as an example, if I were to calculate the properties using quantum mechanics of 100,000 known crystalline materials, if I did that in 1980, it would take me 30 years. If I do that now, it takes me a few days. Okay? So we're really at a place where we can do this kind of screening, and that's what I'm going to show you some results on um, uh, now. Um, but we can do it for large numbers of materials and test ideas very quickly. At the same time, the technology on the synthetic chemistry side for, for manipulating these materials at the atomic scale has evolved tremendously. So I think this is a really interesting technology. It's an interesting problem. It has been sort of ignored for, for a few decades that is worth revisiting. Okay. So let me tell you how, how, we've, um, how we've decided to revisit this. Um, what, what, what I want to come back to is this picture of the azobenzene. Okay? And basically, now I'm showing you this forward reaction. Okay, so let me just make sure we, we go through this so you see uh, what this path means. This is the, the azobenzene molecule before it absorbs light. So this is that trans state. It absorbs light, that's this arrow, and it goes on to some other pathway. And that excited state pathway drops it down into this sort of charged state, which is the cis conformation. Um, now, what you can see by drawing the path this way is that there are two really important parameters um, that you need to know about. One is this delta H, which is the energy difference between that excited and ground state, and that's how much energy per molecule you can store. And the other important parameter is the activation energy barrier going back, which 
you know, if it's too small, it's not going to be, uh, have a long enough lifetime in the charge state. And if it's too big, you're never going to get it to, to trigger, right? And, and you can see that just by looking at this path, you can see why this is a hard problem because those, this is a constrained optimization problem, right? And you can see that, you know, if I try to wiggle this, it's probably going to affect this, right? But I'd like to increase this as much as possible, and then I'd like to tune this to exactly what I want, right? And, and that's where this idea comes in of actually, a te of actually uh, bringing a template into the, into the picture, okay? So now we have our photo switch, but I'm going to put it on a template. Um, okay, so the first template that I'll talk about is, is, uh, is a simple, a, a nice, easy template, the carbon nanotube. And, um, and what happens is you take this photo switch, and in this case it's still azobenzene, and you, you covalently bond it to a nanotube. Okay? And you can do that in a way that they stack up next to one another along the nanotube axis. Okay? So you get the stacking of the adsorbed molecules, and the nanotube is a template. Now, these materials actually have already been made. Okay? And you can make them with very high uh, packing densities. Um, and it's also uh, nice that they've been observed already to be fully photoactive when these switches are still fully photoactive when they're put on a nanotube in this way. They have not, however, um, been considered as energy storage materials. Okay? Now let me tell you that you know, a photo switch um, by itself is a, is a really terrible solar thermal fuel. Right? Azobenzene stores uh, just 0.6 electron volts per molecule, so its energy density is not very high, and it has a lifetime of about an hour. That's why we want to see if we can tune uh, those two parameters. And that's what the template allows us to do. So let me walk you through what the role of this template is, and this is a little bit of a busy slide, I apologize, but I'm, I want to go through it. Um, wh what we have is, we have, a, okay, so here's the template, and we have these molecules which are basically ordered on the surface of the template. Now, uh, you can imagine that if I take two azobenzenes like this and I just vary the distance between them, well, you know, they're going to have a weak interaction between them, and so there'll be some point at which they're happy. They're in some energy minimum, right? If I bring them closer than that, they'll repel each other. Farther away, they'll be less and less bonded. That's this cyan uh, square curve here. And what you can see is that the point at which these things are very happy is exactly the spacing of the nanotube. So these things want to be right at the spacing in, in the trans state, in the ground state, right at the spacing that the nanotube gives them. On the other hand, this red curve shows you uh, what happens when you take them in their charge state, in the cis state. Okay? And you can see that the minimum has shifted over. So al already you can, what you can see is happening is there's going to be a steric effect. By of forcing these molecules to stay a certain distance apart, there's going to be a steric effect that raises the energy because it's making this unhappy, right? It's raising the energy of the cis state relative to the trans state. So already you can see just from steric effect that you're going to change delta H. But that's actually not what's most interesting. What's most interesting about this is that you can do new kinds of chemistry. So the template enables the design of specific interactions between these molecules, okay? That you would not have available in free azobenzene. So for example, in this case, what I've done is I've actually put hydroxyl groups onto the azobenzene, you can see that here, in specific places. These are specific places that form intermolecular bonds as well, actually, as intramolecular bonds in, in one way in the trans state and in a different way in the cis state. And I can control that. You see? So I can add bonding between these different molecules that I would not be able to do in any other form of the molecule. So if I, if I add these these hydroxyl groups to these molecules in the gas phase or in, in liquid or, or powder, nothing will change. But because they're being forced into this sort of new solid phase, um, I can do this chemistry and it allows me to tune those parameters. So let me give you, so what we can do is we can screen literally thousands of possibilities, okay, and calculate the, the energy that these things store as well as the barrier uh, for them going back, which is related to the stability. I'm going to show you just a couple of results here. Um, and, and so this is, this is the energy that's stored, okay? And this line is for the free azobenzene. So you can see, if I don't do any chemistry, if I don't add any of those hydroxyl groups, I just get a steric effect. And you can see that that's worth about a couple of tenths of an electron volt increase in the stored energy per molecule. But now it gets really interesting when I start putting those hydroxyl groups in different positions, 
you see I can take advantage of, the, of these chemistries as I just described, and I can actually get a factor of two and a half uh, times the energy storage per molecule when I, when I do it, say, in this way, or in really pretty much any of these ways. And what's really interesting about this is that um, I can also calculate the, that activation barrier, and I can, I, I can purposefully put those hydroxyl groups in such a way that they would, uh, they would change. They can either make it higher or lower the barrier for the switch to go back. And that's related, again, to the lifetime of the charged state. So you can see there are cases where, like in this, in this one that makes the energy go, you know, the, the energy per molecule the largest, the barrier goes down. So you're going to change that lifetime um, uh, downward, which is not necessarily what we want. But if I have this case, where I'm just changing slightly where I put that OH group, I can still get a, a huge increase in the storage energy per molecule, but I can also increase the activation energy. And that looks like a very small increase, but actually remember, this goes into an exponential, right? So the lifetime, in this case, the lifetime will go from hours to about a year for that case, okay? So the charge state can be tuned separately. So I'm not gonna um, um, uh, sort of, Gesundheit, thank you, Melis. Um, I'm not gonna go through uh, uh, this in, in, in detail, but basically, you know, you can now start to play around with sort of the size of the nanotube, um, how nanotubes are going to interact with one another. Another advantage of these hydroxyl groups is that you can actually make it more water soluble. Um, um, and, um, and you can see that as we choose from packing parameters and different nanotube sizes, we can plot the volumetric energy density. And you can see that, um, that, that they really all fall into uh, the range of, of some of the best lithium ion batteries. So we can get uh, a fairly uh, uh, high energy densities. Um, using this particular combination of switch and template, okay? Um, and you can see that compared, so, so now we have the azobenzene CNT system, which is up to 690 watt hours per liter. Um, that's compared with lithium ion batteries, and, and it's substantially more than azo free azobenzene and powder. Um, azobenzene, azobenzene does not like to be in solution, so that's uh, really not fair, but it's a very low number. Um, and, and you can see that the gravimetric energy density of that ruthenium case was, was okay, um, but the volumetric energy density is, is fairly low, so this is substantially larger than that. Um, now, what, what, what's, what's nice about this concept is that this is not um, particular to this photo switch and this template, right? So we can use actually a range of photo switches and do the same kind of thing, and we can use a range of templates, okay? And, and in fact, we can, what's nice about this is we can screen out the problem of degradation from the beginning, because we can simply shoot, there, there's lots of photo switches. Um, luckily for us, they've been studied heavily for other applications. So we can just go to the literature and choose ones that have already been, um, where the cyclability has already been tested, okay? Um, so that sort of gets rid of the cyclability problem. Then we just need to make them into good solar thermal fuels using this concept. Um, I'm not gonna go through this uh, in detail, but I I'll show you a couple of results with other templates. Okay, that, w that we've done, and then I'll, then I'll show you uh, one of the applications we're working on. Um, so, um, so, as I said, you can use different chromophores. Uh, I won't show you those results, but you can also use different templates. Th there are some properties we'd like the template to have. We'd like it to be rigid. We want it to covalently bind those photo switches uh, strongly, right? Because they're releasing a whole lot of local energy, so we don't want them to sort of explode off of the template. Um, we'd like them to have solubility and be transparent and so forth. Um, and so what we decided is, again, to use these same techniques to screen a, a large number of carbon-based templates as a starting point, because these can be made, um, many of these can be made fairly uh, cheaply. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of, of different results. Um, one, one that we're excited about is graphene, because you can actually uh, get a fairly uh, good energy densities. You have a two electron volt bond uh, with the surface. And what we've shown is that you can actually stick these between graphene sheets and make um, layers of these, sandwich layers of these materials, um, which, which is sort of like a solid state phase, if you want, of, of the same material, um, which actually further increases um, the, the, the tunability. Um, we can also use alkene chains. Here we get about the same uh, stored energy as, as graphene. Um, and we can also screen out possibilities that don't work. You might have been able to sort of guess this, but you know, we can show this computationally, that there's essentially no way to stack um, these kinds of switches on a, on a rounded surface because you can't, you basically, there's just too much phase space. So 
you're not going to get these things to order, and it's difficult to access any kind of packing interaction. Um, so we can screen ideas out as well as screen ideas in. Um, and, and, and pentacene is an interesting one. Now, uh, pentacene is interesting because you can make a really strong bond to the outside edge of pentacene. You can get a really nice uh, uh, density uh, per molecule, 1.5 dV. That's about what we got for the nanotube. Um, but it's interesting, actually, because of what, what we found happens for our old friend, norbornadiene. Okay? Um, if we go back to this one, and remember, this is basically sort of the champion of the 70s, if you want. Okay? Um, the problem with, with this was that it degrades. Well, we know what those degradation pathways are. And so we can try to play the same trick. And pentacene turns out to be a really nice template for norbornadiene. Okay? And so we can do the same hydroxyl chemistry on the outside of, 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 um, of norbornadiene and increase the stored energy by a considerable amount doing so. So we have the same effect on the energy. But what's really exciting about this is that if, we, if we're careful about how we place those OH groups, we can also increase substantially the barriers to those degradation pathways. And we haven't tested all of them, but the few degradation pathways we've looked at, when, pen, when norbornadiene is templated like this, basically um, the, the barrier to go to, say, toluene is prohibited. So we, we don't think that that degradation will happen anymore. So we think that the template could also be an interesting way to try to revive um, some, of the, um, some of the older, uh, uh, more studied uh, solar thermal fuels from, the, um, from th 30 years ago. Again, the last example I'll show is, is just that, that you can actually throw the template out. Okay? Um, and, and it turns out that you can actually connect uh, these kinds of switches together in rings. And um, for the same reasons, because you're basically introducing strain into, the, into these molecules, okay, you can also tune the amount of energy stored, which is, I'm showing you here. This is free as a benzene. And then you see for the four-membered ring, you can double the energy stored. Um, by, by ring size, as well as by the, the, the way in which you attach them together, the linker chemistry. So that's just another kind of direction that, that, that we're looking at um, that, again, involves trying to tune these parameters um, independently. And rings can be made, by the way. We're making them in my lab. Um, now, let me just uh, spend a couple minutes on applications, and then I'll turn to the second topic, solar photovoltaics. Um, we're working, you know, when I first started working on this, I, I was really excited. And I, we went and, and, and started collaborating with some students in the Sloan School. And, um, and you know, I'm thinking we're going to sort of, you know, we're going to change the world with this stuff. Um, we're going to, you know, home heating, uh, uh, auxiliary power, you know, somehow we're going to save lots of lives. And they came back and said, no, they looked at this for three months. They said, you're going to de-ice windows. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> because that's the fastest commercialization path. Now, actually, it, it turns out that this is a very interesting material for de-icing. I was a little bit um, put off from that, but, but actually I've come to, to really uh, become interested in this. We can de-ice a window. You can, you can put this inside of a window. You can put this inside of two pieces of glass, right? There's already a lot of stuff inside of a window, right, for, for cracking and so forth. But, um, uh, but you can put these materials inside. You can keep them transparent. And we think you can get hot enough um, uh, temperatures, 300 Celsius, um, and we've done some tests that we, could, we think we can de-ice a window in about two seconds using this. Okay? So that's actually kind of interesting. And it becomes more interesting when you think about things like power lines, where actually lives are at stake and there's a lot of money lost. Um, but anyway, the, the, the example I'll show you that, that, that just, just a couple of slides on is the solar cooker. And you know, this, is, um, this is something we're really excited about. We almost have the prototype uh, uh, finished. Um, and you know, here, some of you may have heard of this problem. right? So, so cooking fuel, like say wood, especially in third world countries, is, is, is increasingly scarce, it's expensive, and very time intensive to find. It leads to about two uh, solar cookers, I'm uh, sorry, uh, wood cooking stoves, wood burning stoves, um, are obviously a, a real problem for global warming, but also for, for health. So about two million people die every year. Um, that's more than, um, uh, that's, that's a lot, okay? The World Health Organization, um, um, has, has put that number out recently, and, and it's sort of generated a lot of interest. I think that's more than malaria and AIDS combined. Um, and, um, and, and it takes about 20 hours uh, for a person per week uh, to find enough wood. Okay? So a lot of problems. Now, solar cookers are around, um, but you can see that they're not exactly very portable. 
Um, these are two solar cookers that are installed on top of a restaurant. I would not want to be one of those chefs. Actually, so you can only cook during the day. Um, and these particular ones, they cost $560. They actually, these particular ones um, come with special goggles and gloves. Because think about it. When you're cooking, you're basically in the oven, right? <laughs> so that's a really tough, uh, that's a tough job. But it is, you know, it, it does overcome these problems, but it, it has some of its own. So we, we're really excited about trying to use this sort of technology in solar cookers, and we've come up with a very simple way of, of essentially flowing the fluid through, through a plate um, to charge it uh, with a little concentrator sitting on top during, uh, during the day. And then when you want to get to, right to, to higher temperatures, even at night, um, mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can just flip it over. Okay, and you can run the liquid the other way, and when you run it the other way, it runs over a catalyst that triggers the release. And again, we can get up to about 300 Celsius. Um, what we've shown, um, we're building this now to test it, but what we've shown with simulations is that, um, is that it can probably be cheap. Um, that's not with simulations, Jeff's just playing numbers. Um, the weight would be, is gonna be uh, less than five kilograms, floor space around a square foot. Um, and we think with about five hours of charge time, we can boil uh, somewhere between two and five liters of water or cook uh, for almost an hour. Okay, so that's something, uh, that's just one example of an application that we're looking at uh, in, in solar thermal fuels. So now I'd like to turn to a, a different topic, a different way of using the sun's energy, and that is to make um, electrons and holes with it. And you know, many of you may have seen inductions to solar PV like this. If I could just build um, six 200 kilometer squared fields um, at the hottest, the places where there's the most sun, around the world, you'd have 20 terawatts of power. That's half of what we think we'll need um, in 2050. Those numbers are, of course, very hand-waving. But in any case, I, um, you know, the reason we don't do something like this is that it would cost $50 trillion, right? Now, I, I think these are fun to look at, but they're sort of, you know, they're, they're not very practical uh, uh, ways to motivate uh, solar PV. So I think a more interesting one um, is, is something that my colleague Vladimir Bulovich um, and, and told me about, and that would be to look at sort of a more realistic goal, okay? Now, it turns out that the price of electricity is, of course, not the same. It depends where you are. And if you plot the price of one kilowatt hour of electricity uh, versus the percent of, elect of electrical energy sold in the U.S. at or below that price, you get a curve like this. And if we take the most expensive electricity, just the top 10%, okay, then we get down to 14 cents. So I think that's a very interesting way um, to look at a target, a realistic target. Um, and because what that means is that at 14 cents per kilowatt hour, PV could cost effectively replace 10% of the U.S. electricity use. Okay? The advantage of that, this is a big one, is that no storage would be needed, right? Because, you, you know, to go beyond 10%, if you took people who, who work on the grid, you know, to go beyond 10% is sort of, uh, it's unrealistic until we have a completely revolutionary advance in storage. You cannot, basically this is sort of the threshold. This is kind of a nice number, it works out this way. Um, and if you look at it, you could deploy this, kind, this amount of, of PV energy in about 10 years with very little land use. Okay. Now, how do we get there? Well, um, currently the cost is too high. Okay, that's the problem. And if you look at the breakdown, depending on the type of, of, of solar cell, um, now the installation dominates the total cost. Okay, so the active layer and module actually are, uh, are a smaller fraction of the total cost. So how can you impact installation? Well, one way is to reduce the weight, right? So I think that's a very appealing direction um, to look to get to this kind of target. Um, and you'd like to get off of glass substrates, right? So using low temperature processing is certainly uh, falls in line with that. And of course, you'd like to use cheap and abundant materials. And by the way, you know, this weight is, is a real limiter, limiting factor, right? I mean, this is, you know, the size uh, that you can make a solar panel to put on your roof is actually dictated by the amount that a worker is allowed to lift amount of weight a worker is allowed to lift while working on your roof. It depends on the state. Um, and so, you know, the glass is heavy. It's great, it's cheap, but it's really heavy, right? Now, there are a lot of different other, there, there are a lot of different kinds of solar cell technologies, and they can also be broken down by the module cost and the installation. You can see installation is more in each case. As you decrease the efficiency, you can see installation uh, skyrockets. Here, Deutsche Bank decided to call about 10 different materials just nano. I find kind of strange. Um, but in any case, um, you know, these are polymers, quantum dots, many things sort of grouped together. But this insulation is, is so high because 
this is normalized for the same amount of power, right? So you've got to install a whole lot more of this stuff because it's very low efficiency. In any case, I, I think this is a really interesting direction to go in, in trying to cost down. But all of these thin film uh, PV technologies suffer from one or more of the following. They either ha suffer from lifetime, so stability is a big problem. Um, efficiencies are still low, um, especially down here. Um, and, and then some of the other technologies, like SIGs, have manufacturing issues. Um, of course, supply, material supply is another one. I'm not going to go through this at all. This is the NREL chart of, don't worry, <laughs> um, of, uh, of you know, different solar cell technologies versus, uh, in their efficiency versus year. And so, so if you haven't looked at this graph, download it and just stare at it tonight. Bring it to, to the clubs, show it to friends. It's a really fun uh, graph. To, to look at. I just want to point out that um, I like to be here. Um, I love this lower right quadrant. Okay? These are, this is sort of like, you know, some people might say that's the bottom of the barrel, right? These are really low efficiency cells. Um, but I think they're really exciting because I think they have enormous potential. And you can see that some of them, like these are polymer based cells, have a really appealing slope. Quantum dot cells, very nice. Um, amorphous silicon, which I'm going to tell you about some of the work we're doing, looks flat, right? And it is flat. For 15 years, it's been flat. But I see an opportunity there. Right? I think there's a lot of room for improvement in these. And, and the nice thing about these is these are all thin film, um, and they may have opportunities, again, for, um, uh, for, to hit some of those, those key uh, targets that I just showed you. So let me go through a couple of examples of the work we're doing in these different areas of solar PV. Um, first, I'll tell you about amorphous silicon. And um, then I'll tell you about a, a kind of new material blend I'm, I'm really excited about. And if I have time, I'll talk about uh, some other things. But I want to finish with some work we're doing on 3D uh, solar cells. Now, you know, so crystalline sil silicon still dominates the market. Um, uh, amorphous silicon is less than 5% of the market. And that is because its efficiency is, is, is substantially lower, um, as you saw on the, on the previous graph. But there are a lot of potential advantages of amorphous silicon over crystalline silicon, right? It can be made cheaper, thin, flexible materials. Um, it has uh, uh, vapor phase deposition, uh, better absorption than crystalline silicon. Here's a micron of amorphous silicon compared to crystalline silicon. You can see that you can absorb almost twice as much. And furthermore, there's a huge room for improvement, right? So here is uh, crystalline skin. This is the shockley quisar limit. This is basically a theoretical limit for how efficient you can make a single junction cell. Here it's plotted as a function of the band gap, the material. Okay? Um, and for crystalline silicon, you can see that we've, we're pretty much there. We're doing really well with crystalline silicon in the lab, by the way. Right? You try to buy something more than 18% on the market, and that's really hard. But, that's, but we're doing really well in terms of lab efficiencies, whereas amorphous silicon, we're here. Right? So there's a lot of room for improvement. Now, what's going on? Well, the key limiting factor in amorphous silicon is the mobility of the holes. Okay? It's thousands of times slower than uh, in crystalline silicon. So the question we can ask computationally is, what's happening here? What's trapping holes? Okay? So let me show you how we're tackling this. Um, the first work that we did in this was we generated amorphous samples. And we, we, we decided just to plot the energy that it would take to, to rotate a bond. See, it turns out that this bond rotation that, that you could see in this movie here, it's not a very exciting view, sorry, but there it is. Um, that, it's exciting to me. <laughs> but that, um, that bond rotation happens all the time in amorphous silicon, right? It happens all the time. See, amorphous silicon is a messy rotation, is a messy uh, material. It's just full of defects. So making more defects is, is sometimes doesn't cost any energy. So what, but the question is, which defects do what to those holes, right? Can we try to correlate something? And so what we did is we created lots of samples, and we rotated lots of bonds, and we plot how much energy it, it takes to rotate the bond. In a lot of cases, it doesn't take any energy, versus whether the new sample traps a hole or not, right? More than the previous one. And you can see that in some cases, you create dangling bonds, and those are worth the, you know, about 0.4 EV of a trap for that hole. So that's a pretty big hole trap. But interestingly, we found that there are cases where you don't create any dangling bonds at all, cases that are energetically very favorable because they sit around zero, but that can trap holes really strong, even much more than dangling bonds. Okay? And so what this shows is that, is that there's something about the strain in the lattice that can be very detrimental to hole transport. Okay? And, and I won't go into the details, but what, what we found is that, that it, it turns out that it has to do with 
basically the, the delocalization of the strain. You see, if you concentrate strain really tightly, then the hole has to be concentrated, and that makes its kinetic energy high, and it doesn't like that. Right? So what, you'd really, what the holes really like is to be spread over about two or three bonds. Right? And so there are just the right kinds of strain that do that. And then the question is, can we correlate that to something in the material that we can get a lever on to prevent it? Right? And so that's what, we're, that's what we're doing now. So that's work we did a couple years ago. Let me show you what we're doing now. Really quickly, in the computation, and this is important, you cannot study an amorphous material computationally on just one sample. You'll get anything you want. Right? So you have to take a statistical approach. And, and really, you can't just take 10 either. That's not near enough. Right? You need thousands. Um, and, and so that's what we do. We generate thousands of samples um, using a Monte Carlo approach. We relax them all. Uh, we anneal them in, in density functional theory, and we relax them further. And we generate data sets that we can actually get statistics on. And this is just uh, um, one example of what, what we can do. Okay, So here's, here's, this, here's those samples. This is one data set of about 1,000 samples. Okay, This is the sample number. And this is how strongly that sample wants to hold on to a hole relative to basically some arbitrary uh, you know, number for the whole set. Um, and what you can see is that there's sort of an average around here, and anybody who's looked at, at, at these kinds of materials knows that there has to be a tail. right? These are these, these Erbach tails um, where you have high traps. But you can see already from looking at this, so you know, these are, by the way, these are the ones we care about. It's the high traps that matter most. Those are the ones that are really going to kill the device performance. And you can see already why you need so many samples, because we're not going to get enough high traps to study unless we take this size set. Right? And so, so, one of the th so once we have these sets, what we can do is we can play with them in the computer right? and, and try to find ways of lowering these traps. Okay? Um, and, and one way that we've shown, and th this is now the traps ordered okay, by how high they are. Um, and what you can see, the red is with no stress, but as we add stress system, you get down to the blue. So you can see that we can get rid of, on average, most of those very high traps by adding enough two-dimensional strain. And it's interesting, there's some interesting points about this having to do with the difference between two-dimensional and three-dimensional stress. It turns out that 2D strain um, is, um, is more effective at knocking those high traps down than 3D. OK. Now, I want to tell you about one other concept that we're working on, and then I'll, I'll no clock. Okay, I'll tell you about one other. <laughs> so I have another hour, right, Chris? Is that right? Okay. So another solar cell material that we're, we're I'm, I'm very excited about. I call all carbon in quotes, and, and it's because there's a little other stuff, but these are not polymers. Okay. So these are basically sort of the the building blocks of carbon, right? These nanoscale materials, nanotubes, uh, graphene, functionalized graphene. And the idea here is, can we, can we make solar cells out of just these building blocks? Right? And that's appealing because these uh, would be very mechanically stable, uh, strong, thermally stable. They're good electron conductors. They can be good hole conductors. And they're actually excellent light absorbing materials. Um, and so, you know, so one of the things that we started doing is we said, well, could we make bulk heterojunction cells? Right? Could we put uh, fullerenes and just blend them with nanotubes? What would happen? The first question you'd have to answer is how these things line up. So PCBM is just a functionalized uh, fullerene. It's a fullerene with a little tail. And we can put that in the computer up against different size nanotubes, and we can look at their density of states and decide over here whether it's a type 1 or type 2 junction that forms. So the ones that are circled in, in purple, those diameter tubes form a type 2 junction. Okay. And the ones that are circled in black form a type 1 which would not be favorable. So we can already look at, at these sorts of materials and try to comb through phase space and see where you might have good, good materials to blend. So then you go in the lab, which we did with our, our collaborator, and, and you put it together with just the right size, and you get absolutely no solar cell. This is not a solar cell. Right? This is the IV sweep. Right? And what's really interesting, so this, this does not make um, any photocurrent. What's really interesting is that now when we add, so this is, these are nanotubes and, and fullerenes, but when we add reduced graphene oxide, which looks like this, okay, you get a really nice solar cell. That's your solar cell, right? That's actually, this is, this is not well optimized or anything. This is a 1.5% cell, okay, using a blend of just these three materials. 
So this is, a, I, I think, a really interesting and exciting um, a kind of, of solar cell. And you know, reduced graphene oxide has been used in PV recently. It's been used as the acceptor material in quantum dot cells, in electrode material. It's been used as a whole transport layer. Um, what I'm interested in is how could we use it in all carbon PV? What could we do with it? And that's a really interesting and hard problem. Hard is what makes it interesting in some ways. This is a horrible, uh, sorry, cartoon of the device. But now we need to calculate these kinds of interfaces. So the experiments tell us RGO is doing something. Now we have all these other interfaces we need to look at, because those are forming. I mean, that's hard, because the space space of, our, of graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide, is enormous. Right? There's all kinds of variability, carbon oxygen ratio, whether the functionalization of the oxygen is ordered or not, um, what functional groups are on there, hydroxyl, epoxy, carbonyl, and ether. And just to give you an example, we started calculating this phase space. And here is the band gap of a sheet of reduced graphene oxide versus oxygen concentration for different ratios of two different functional groups, epoxy and OH groups on the surface. And you can see already that even in this very limited um, range of chemistries and materials, you have a huge range of, of the band gap. And so that's actually really exciting um, to us in terms of, of opportunities for these, for these materials. And last on this topic, um, we're excited because it's a really different kind of solar cell. This is not a bulk heterojunction cell. Right? In a bulk heterojunction cell, you, you, you typically look at it in a, in a simple picture as a donor and acceptor, right? two phases of two different materials, say fullerenes and polymers. Um, but here, you know, we're, it's a three-phase material, right? And we're, we're very likely not going to be able to control the morphology in any way like this. And so we have to accept that this cell has, has basically a heterogeneous set of band alignments. These are not type two junctions everywhere. There's type two some places, type one others, uh, broken gap junctions in other places. So how do we even compute the, the open circuit voltage for this kind of device, right? How do we improve it? So that's also something that I think is, a, is, is an exciting challenge. And I have a couple minutes. I'm going to skip what we're there. I'm going to skip that. Never bet against silicon. Um, and then I want to tell you about one last thing, just two minutes. Um, that's, <laughs> sorry. Uh, silicon learning curve is incredible. Um, and it's a moving target. We say, you know, we have to beat silicon, or some, some people say that. I don't, uh, but you know, it's moving. You can't beat silicon today. You need to beat it in, in 10 years from now. It, it would be very easy for us to calculate how much energy a flat panel generates. This is my last topic um, in just a few minutes. Um, we know how to do that, but the question that I wanted to ask was, um, what would happen if you fold those sides up? Right? How do you calculate the energy that that structure generates? Um, these are now macroscopic. This is not atoms and, and, and nanometer scale. Of course, you have to have micro and nanometer texturing on the surface for light trapping of, of any solar cell. But this is really what happens for macroscopic shapes. Um, and it's not that interesting to have a box, but what's more interesting is to ask the question, you know, it's, it's actually not that hard to calculate how much power this generates. But what's interesting is to ask, what's the ideal shape? Right? What would it be? Uh, you can imagine many different beautiful shapes, but what we decided to do is to take a more systematic approach. So we developed a code that can take any volume of arbitrary uh, shape, okay? So here it's completely random, and it can optimize that shape. And it uses a genetic algorithm to do this, so it basically evolves this volume of shape into some emergent structure. So we, we, how do we evolve it? Well, we have a fitness function. We have a fitness function. In this case, it's the energy that that volume generates in, say, a day. It could be the energy that it generates in a, in a season or in a year. And it turns out that this is actually um, um, quite interesting because, um, you know, you, you're always, if you fold, look, if you take a three-dimensional structure and you fold it out flat, you'll always generate more energy, right? You'll always win. But there are interesting advantages that I think it's sort of time to look at. The time is, is, I think, ripe to look at because of the fact that installation is now the dominant cost. And the cost of the material, the cost of the active layer, is going down and down and down. Um, and, and so the advantages of 3D turn out to be really interesting. For one thing, the taller you make it, the more energy you can generate. It goes linearly with height, right? Because you're getting all of that morning and, and afternoon. And since you're never really at the equator, or at least I'm not, um, you, you get it at, you know, during midday as well, right? And the other interesting thing that we found is that when you have a 3D structure with no tracking, you can get pretty even power, right? Whereas if you have a flat panel and you don't track it, 
you get about five hours of usable electricity. Um, so, um, so we thought this was really interesting and we wanted to explore it more and that's sort of what, what we've done. Um, we've shown that you could use mirrors in a 3D structure, right? Take advantage of, of reflection from other buildings or from the cell itself. Um, you can make origami-like structures that you, could, you can imagine. Um, they start flat and you can just unfold them into sort of the ideal 3D shape. And we think that there could be really interesting uh, wiring advantages in going 3D. Um, the, what we've done recently is, um, is we've actually tested these. Okay? So we've actually built uh, little shapes according to our models. And they agree very well in terms of how much energy they, they can generate in a day. Um, by the way, this is position dependent. So we've made a map of the world, and to an date depends on where you are. Um, uh, but what's interesting is, so, so, so this was, um, this was uh, uh, done in Boston. Now, you can't put a 3D structure in a solar simulator. It doesn't work, it turns out. Um, you need to, so we used our rooftop. And, um, and it, took th it took two weeks to get a sunny day. So this is not Santa Barbara. And I, was, I lived in Berkeley for 12 years. That really frustrated me. Um, and, uh, and yet, it was really interesting. See, there is an advantage to cloud cover. Um, because you see, in our, in our calculations, in all the calculations, we don't have weather. That's actually really hard. So all our calculations have sunny days. Um, but in the, exper in the experiments, we were able to look at what happens for all these sort of stormy, cloudy days. And it turns out that when you go, if you divide, say, the energy generated by a 3D structure, divided by the flat panel on these different types of weather days, you can see that as you go to t taller structures, um, you get um, a much, let's say, less of a hit on a cloudy day versus a sunny day. Okay? So 3D actually allows you to take advantage of diffuse light scattering more than uh, a, a flat panel, considerably more. Okay, so that, that was an, another one of the interesting um, benefits that we found. Okay, this is my last slide. So, I, I, so some, some of you may have seen this. This is actually a map of the world and, and the lights, sort of with the lights on. So this is how much energy, well, you know, in terms of electricity, how much we use and the population shown in red. Um, and you can see that there are some places where there's a really heavy correlation and there are some places where there's a very weak correlation. I don't think the question is really um, about whether these people are turning their lights on. The question is really just how. And that's why I think this is, um, you know, I, I, I sort of think this is a really compelling case. And, and you know, the studies show that, you know, in, in not too long from now, the developing countries, these places here will be turning their lights on. There's no question. And they'll be equal in CO2 um, with, with so-called developed countries. But, but they're also projected to skyrocket after that, right? unless we can, we can sort of change the course. And how do we change the course? Well, let me tell you, it's not with funding from the government today. Um, you know, and, and some people think that we actually, there's a lot of money available to do alternative en energy research. Um, and and I, I really disagree, given the urgency of the problem. Um, and, and so this is just sort of a breakdown. This is a little old, but this hasn't changed too much. And you can see if you separate out energy fun funding for energy from general science and health, you can see it's this little lead curve there. Okay? So I don't think that's commensurate with, um, with the problem at hand. Um, and finally, I just would like to thank uh, the, I, I feel uh, extremely lucky to work with the, the students and postdocs that I do in my group. And so I'd like to thank them um, for doing all of the beautiful work that they do, and uh, the funding agencies and competing centers, and you all for listening to me. Thanks. That's a great question. We it depends on the on the on the switch. Um, we've found that very cheap sort of even charcoal type catalysts can work. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything fancy or expensive. Yeah. We took for the, for the ruthenium um, stuff when I was still in Berkeley, we, we took some off the shelf that had been charged up on the balcony. And it had been, I think, eight years. Put a little on a slide and took a piece of charcoal to it and it popped off the slide. Which is actually, you know, I mean, that's just cool. But, I don't, you know, so it just showed that it, it, it was very stable. Um, Yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, how do you make sure that in the excited state, it does what it's supposed to do when it's not packed? So do you also mm. take care uh, in your yeah. high school to search that it still remains a switch? Or to find that, 
engineer the ground state and you accept that an excited state it will go where you want it to be? Oh, no, no, we, we have the excited state as well. In, in, in the searching um, that we do, um, we, and, and I should say, you know, most of it is sort of intuition driven. Um, you know, you can't just blindly um, search, although we do have a high throughput component that's, that's looking at, you know, at, at large databases and molecules. But, um, um, you know, the, we look at both the ground and excited states and the, and the barrier between them. Right? That's, that's very important. To I mean, electronic excitation. Oh, no, so, so the, forward, the photo forward part, so this is the heat release which is related to the stability of the charge state. The photo forward part, which has to do with sort of the, 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 if you want, the quantum yield, right? How much of this stuff can you convert? Also, right, the, the charge state can be triggered to go back by light. So you don't want it to be the same frequency of light as the ground state, right? Otherwise, your quantum yield is going to be low. So those are all things we can also tune and, and compute. Those are harder. So, so we are working on the, 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 the photo excited uh, states, but those are computationally more intensive, so we don't do them on as many systems. But one thing that we showed just really quickly is that you know with this templating, uh, you actually can and functionalization, you also have a band gap as a tunable parameter. So we'd like to get these a little bit out of the UV where they are now, and have a little bit more closer to the visible in terms of their absorption, and we can do that actually with with the right chemistries. Yeah. Okay, when you do the calculation of uh, the ad bending and uh, uh, top nanotubes, did you consider the interaction between ad bending and top nanotubes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fully electron. It's a fully quantum mechanical electronic structure calculation. So all the you know the the bonding between the the molecule and the tube is 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 solved uh, using density functional theory. Like uh, other bending layer maybe interact with the surface carbon tube because they have pipe interaction. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we don't. You you can't mix azobenzene and nanotubes. <laughs> that doesn't work at all. You have to go through about eight different synthesis steps. Okay. First, first making azobenzene into sort of, you know, azobenzene prime, really triple prime, right? So you do different chemistry steps to get the linker onto the azobenzene, to put the OHs where we want them. And then you have to functionalize the carbon nanotubes in, in different ways. And there are different ways you can do this so that, so that they will uh, attach the linker, right? Um, okay, so, so you, if you just put azobenzene in a solution with nanotubes, you're absolutely right. They're just going to line up their, their pi stack. So like this uh, photo switch usually happen in solution states? And no, it can happen in gas yeah. phase, it can happen in powder. Actually, some of these photo switches, um, isobenzene is one of them, are, are highly non-stable in, in water at least. Um, so it depends on the switch. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Can, can, I, can I have another picture? A really short one. Fine yeah. with me. Ah, how about your uh, single one come on to the yeah. photo field? Like, uh, did you remove the conducting part of the single wall, uh, single wall carbon tube? Yeah, that's actually a good question. You know, we don't, uh, the, the nice thing about using nanotubes, and again, you know, I, I want to emphasize that, you know, that's just one of many templates that work. Um, but the nice thing about, about using nanotubes for this work is we don't care, right? If it's metallic or semiconducting, it has absolutely no effect on, on this material as a solar thermal fuel, and, and we've shown that. Um, so, so the whole problem of selecting the right chirality or, um, or even double or single you know, wall tubes. If it's double wall, it's, it's unfortunate because I take a hit on my gravimetric density, but it's not that, it doesn't change the properties of the fuel. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the amorpho silicon. Uh, yeah. What is the size of the amorpho silicon you use? In the computation? Yeah. So uh, the, some of those sets were about 260. I think 260 silicon atoms and 34, I'm guessing, roughly, hydrogen atoms. 10% hydrogen, so that doesn't work. Anyway, it, it was, you know, it, it was 250-ish atoms total. Um, and then we did, um, you know, we did smaller sets, but still hundreds of samples at the 500 and 520, 30 atom scale to test whether there were sort of longer range effects that we needed to worry about. We are doing that, actually. Yeah, my collaborator, um, Antonio Bonacisi at, at MIT, is, is doing exactly this. Um, and so what, what he's doing is we're depositing amorphous silicon onto substrates, and we're, we're, we're bending them to induce uh, the stress and, and measuring 
um, the properties. You know, there, there, is, there are some issues with, you know, the calculation, so a fairly high amount of, of strain is needed, of, of stress is needed, but, um, and so the question is, you know, whether we'll, we'll go through some sort of mechanical or, or cracking problems before that. But, um, um, but we are, this is definitely a combined uh, experimental uh, theoretical effort. Let me, let me emphasize that, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, you mentioned if we find one, one sample, um, you just can't do amorphous materials that way. You know, really all the, at least, you know, in my opinion, for amorphous silicon, all that matters is, is whether the set, whether something happens to the full statistical set or not. Um, and, and so that's where, um, you know, we have other ideas besides just stress, but, you know, we're working on sort of substitutional dopants and other, other things. But if you don't um, look at the effects on the whole set, then it, it's not clear um, th that it'll be accurate. Yeah. Sure. I, I can imagine that you can apply a fairly high stress to just one bending. Yeah. Now, intuitively, I, I have this idea that you're going to get degradation. But yeah. Because it's a morphous material, it, yeah. it's going to try and release the stress. Is yeah. It, is my intuition right? Or yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, this is all going to be sort of a race to, to the effect you want. And I, I think your intuition is absolutely right. I don't know at what stress that's going to happen, though. Um, and, and so we haven't seen that in the experiments so far. Um, but we also haven't seen a, a big increase in the efficiency. Uh, so, you know, so we're not at, at the place we want to be yet. And you hope to uh, not run it for 10 years to see yeah, uh, that's that right. there's something Yeah, exactly. Because they're, exactly. It's a very good point. Yeah. It's good we still have work to do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, we are starting to compute that, you know, th those calculations, um, so, so these are for the all-carbon PV, um, those are, those kinds of calculations um, require uh, uh, approaches that go beyond density functional theory, um, and so we're starting to do those calculations, um, in particular we're using GW as a method in case you've heard of it, um, and um, uh, I don't really have results to show yet, but that's a very important part of this. Um, well, uh, yeah, so, so the, yeah, okay, good question. So let's see, what were the external quantum efficiencies? Um, I don't remember that offhand. We had, our, our record cell was 1.5%. And, a half percent. Um, and um, again, you know, this is literally like a couple months of, of what we're working. We haven't tried to optimize these yet very much. But it's 1.5%. I think the VOC was about 0.8. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, uh, the fill factor was pretty low. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's still a, a so an open question. Because, uh, you know, you still try to understand how the device works. Yeah. So there are three components in it. Yeah. And so, but if you know the energy absorption of each of the and the energy level, yeah. then you can perhaps understand uh, what the energy is and where yeah. you can profile to each of these components. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's an excellent point. I think, so, so we have looked at sort of just theoretically, you know, how thick we should make the samples. But that, you know, we, that's just looking at them in an isolated fashion, like you say. And, and things could be different when, these, when they're forming junctions. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's absolutely something that, that we'll be doing. And, and, um, and that's what's, ex you know, what's exciting about this kind of solar cell is there's just so many questions we need to still understand. But the, but the, the data is, is, is exciting. You know, I think, I think um, it's not on that NREL map yet, right? <laughs> um, but it's even lower in that quadrant than the other ones. Um, and I think it's going to have a, an upward trajectory as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, do you know how much of a decrease in efficiency you get when you string cells together and build modules? When you string cells together, what do you mean? Uh, can you be more so, specific? So when you commercialize these cells, yeah. um, but just when you, you pull off mod cells together and create a Oh, I see. Right? Yeah, so is yeah. There a in um, yeah, I that that's that's getting a couple of steps ahead <laughs> of of where we are. Yeah, um, I I don't, okay. but it's a, it's a good question. I, you know, we're we're not we're nowhere near commercialization, you know, at this stage. Um, but um, uh, but it's a good question that I haven't thought about. I don't I don't really have a good answer. Yeah. Okay, so that all carbon solar cells. Yeah. Great question. We are doing, you know, we're doing um, high-res TEM. We're trying to understand sort of what is where. Um, 
we're doing calculations, um, as I showed, between these different interfaces, including now RGO, which is in itself a, a, a highly complex and rich material. Um, and, um, and right now, um, you know, we, we don't know whether it's an electronic effect and, and it's helping to get the charges out, uh, get the charges separated, or whether it's simply a morphological effect. And the RGO is actually helping to phase segregate, let's say, the you know, it's helping to reduce bundling of the nanotubes, which is always a problem. Yeah. Hopefully in the next month or so we might have answers to that question. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to. Anytime. Yeah. Until then, thank you very much again. Thanks.